Our first speaker is Michael Neufeld, who is a museum curator in the Space History Division of the National Air and Space Museum, this museum. From, two, excuse me, from 2007 to 2011, he served as division chair. Born and raised in Canada, he has four history degrees, including a PhD from the Johns Hopkins University. Dr. Neufeld is the author of The Skilled Metal Workers of Nuremberg, The Rocket and the Reich, which won two Brook Prizes, and Van Braun, which has won three awards. He has appeared on numerous television and radio programs, notably the History Channel, PBS, NPR, BBC, and the German ZDF. Dr. Neufeld will talk about access to space, visions, and reality. So good morning. Um, my job to today is essentially to set up this and talk about how we went from imagining the possibility of going into space to actually doing it and up to today and, and the problems that we face in terms of, of making this more accessible and more real. But just to go back to the beginning, of course there was there were, uh, 2,000 years of speculation about space travel going all the way back to the Roman world. But I think until the 19th century, that was largely in the form of satire or imagination, not in the imagine of realistic possibilities of space travel. And this was, of course, Jules Verne with From the Earth to the Moon in 1865, who first attempted to imagine a realistic technological solution to sending humans into space. Uh, of course, famously with a cannon, uh, which uh, uh, all the early space pioneers rapidly or almost instantaneously figured out would have reduced their space travelers to uh, uh, biological matter about a micron thick in the uh, you know ten, a million G uh, launch, but uh, but was incredibly important for uh, inspiring the imagination of people in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Many of the space pioneers themselves. Uh, uh, mentioned that Verne was the, the Verne's novels was the thing that started them on the road thinking well how could we solve the space uh, travel problem how could we get into space and it inspired um, several more of course famous science fiction novels notably H.G. Wells but none of these guys had a realistic propulsion technology how would you actually get people off the planet into space but I should mention, and I mentioned here with the Industrial Revolution, and Vern, we are in an age where suddenly it seems technologically possible to do things. We are now have steamships and trains, and, uh, and particularly when you hit the 20th century, aviation it takes, it, is very, very important for inspiring the imagination for flight. The real keystone was how do we, how, what would the technology be? And the idea that the rocket could be used as the way to go into space simultaneously occurred to a number of people in different parts of the planet. Virtually all of them felt like they were the first person to think of it and uh, were, had a unique idea. It's interesting to think that this idea, which is so obvious to us now that the rocket is the propulsion system for space travel, was not at all obvious circa 1900. The only rocket that existed is essentially the gunpowder rocket. It had not significantly improved since its invention by the Chinese 800 years before that. Uh, it, it, uh, most people misunderstood rocket uh, physics. They thought you needed the atmosphere for the rocket exhaust to push against. And so it wasn't really clear that this was the technology to go. Several visionaries, however, began to think with the new advances in chemistry and physics to think about that a rocket might actually be the way to go. And I have a picture here of four of the key people, uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky in Russia, uh, who was one of the earliest, uh, 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 Robert Goddard on the upper right in the United States, Hermann Obert, who was a uh, German, uh, German minority in what later became Romania, and uh, Robert Esnopeteri in France, an aviation pioneer who also uh, thought about the possibility of space travel as early as 1908. Goddard was the one of these who really went and did rocket experiments. 
in, in, a, in a major and successful way, starting in the 1920s, and of course we have in this museum several of the artifacts that that uh, made it that he created because of his close relationship with the Smithsonian. However, the real breakthrough in rocketry was not due to the space pioneers, except in an inspirational way, fundamentally. It was due to military money. The V2, which is of course sitting outside this room here, with pictured on the upper left, was the fundamental technological breakthrough that changed everything. And it was about, it wasn't about space, except again in the sort of inspiration of some of the rocket engineers. Uh, it was about moving a warhead to the other, to some other place hundreds and later thousands of miles away that resulted in fundamental investments in technology. The V2, I've argued in, in a couple of publications, accelerated the timetable. Uh, it's only possible to imagine Sputnik in 1957 and the ICBM the same year because of the V2. Uh, they would have happened anyway. They would have happened a little differently and maybe it would have been five or ten years later, but certainly the whole timetable was accelerated by the German investment in rocket technology, an investment which ironically uh, didn't do the Third Reich any good. In fact, it, it harmed the war economy and was a big waste of money. The people who benefited from the V2 were the United States, the Soviet Union, France, Britain, and several other countries. Uh, this led uh, because of the Cold War, then ensued immediately after World War II, uh, the ballistic missile revolution continued. And you had massive investments in technology. And you have here on the upper right, Redstone, which is essentially von Braun's American V2, the R7 that launched Sputnik, the first ICBM, and on the lower right, uh, I believe a Poseidon or Trident um, uh, submarine launched ballistic missile. Key technological revolutions that were solved between World War II and the end of the 1950s. Liquid propellants, which of course the space pioneers had seen as the breakthrough out of the gunpowder rocket. Guidance and control. Then for military purposes, solid propellants, much more uh, usable for uh, military purposes. Reentry vehicles, later, you, you know, would soon be used to get people back, but its first fundamental purpose was to get a nuclear warhead on Moscow or Washington. Uh, 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 and also, uh, as the scale and complexity of these rocket programs grew greater and greater, the systems management approaches that were needed in order to manage the complexity, the great complexity of these systems. Now, before even we'd gone into space, however, there were already imagination, and, and, and um, Howard has sp spoken about it today and also with his a very good book, Ima Space and the American Imagination, the role of imagination in all of this. Two basic ways of going into space had been pictured from the very early days of space enthusiasm. One, the pure rocket, uh, as in that Hermann Obert uh, advocated, and you have here his design in the the first real, realistic science fiction movie, Frau and Mond, in 1929. But the space plane was an idea that just fascinated the space pioneers. The assumption, the hope was that, you know, instead of putting yourself on the end of purely, uh, on a purely rocket, having stages to throw away, that you would build a space plane and be able to glide down and land on a runway. You can see in the upper right, of course, with the Colliers, uh, magazine, the first cover of the very first uh, series that was started and published in 1952, Von Braun imagined a space plane himself, a guy who would really come out of this pure rocket tradition, but he was infatuated with the idea that we would have a wing space plane that would land on a runway, uh, and that, uh, that was a vision that remained and, uh, and has remained very influential. But, you know, as I've argued, as I would argue based on uh, many comments that Roger Lanius has made, the space plane really can be viewed as social construction of technology. It's a, an idea that people are obsessed with making true, even if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense economically or otherwise, as it turns out. Of course, the space race ensued from Sputnik. And that meant that the idea of the space plane had to be shelved. There were experiments. They didn't lead to anything. We, we used our ballistic missile technology, initially, literally, put humans and, uh, and payloads on top of ballistic missiles, then developed larger launch vehicles based on this ICBM technology, and capsules. 
to get back through the atmosphere and not space planes. The moon race certainly impels significant innovation in rocket development, notably liquid hydrogen technology, uh, which uh, the early pioneers, you already see it in Goddard, in Obert, in Tsiolkovsky, all based on chemistry calculated that the ideal liquid repellent combination would be liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Uh, so this moon race does uh, impel innovation. I, I, guess I, I guess this slide is a little out of sync with what others have said. I agree that NASA did not have a blank check. However, it did have a whole lot of room in its budget. And to, uh, to what extent it's apocryphal, I don't know, but allegedly Webb went up to the hill and was told by his engineers that Apollo would cost $10 billion. He said, all right, it's, uh, I'll tell Congress it's $20 billion. <laughs> because he had the political room to, to allow a, a factor of, of, of increase in the program that did not exist when the shuttle program came along. There was no political room to double the estimate to give some room for, for underestimation. But the bottom line, of course, was not lowering launch cost. It was getting these things successfully into space. So the primary objective was not making space flight cheaper. It was getting rockets that didn't blow up. And very significant progress was made in the 1960s from turning something which, you know, we have all of these uh, wild explosions and rockets flying off in all directions. There's great video of that to a a situation where by the end of the 60s you have something like a 90% launch rate, and in the case of human spaceflight, effectively a 100% success rate all the way up to the Challenger accident in 1986. Now, getting back to the script seems to have been very much on the minds of NASA engineers. Well, we've got these throwaway rockets, this is inefficient. What we really want to do is have a space plane. And so you see this particularly, George Miller in the 1960s began pushing very heavily that a space shuttle, a, 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 a space plane was the, uh, a reusable vehicle was the answer. Uh, he and Werner von Braun and some of the uh, engineers like Max uh, Faget at Hunt Houston all accepted the fact that this was the way to go. One of the things that they advertised was that the, the, the shuttle was the DC-3 of space, that it would be the thing that made spaceflight routine. They were actually transfixed by an air transportation model, that, that rocketry and human flight in space was essentially at the stage of the 1920 biplane, and that once you built the vehicle that would make space travel routine to at least low Earth orbit, then the entire thing would be dramatically transformed. And of course that led to the claims in NASA attempting to sell the shuttle at the beginning of the 70s that the total launch costs could be reduced from $10,000 a pound to as little as $100 a pound, two order of magnitude improvement in, in this. And of course the result is, and partly as Howard has said, uh, the limitations on the innovation and the limitations on the budget, you've got a, 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 a something that was very oversold. Uh, its, its benefits were grossly exaggerated because it was the only way to sell the program to Congress and uh, the calculations were wildly optimistic. Although I think it wasn't dishonest, they, a lot of the engineers really believed that they landed on the moon, they could certainly revolutionize the cost of space transportation. And the result was the space shuttle, which was a marvelous technological success and a complete economic failure. It did not lower the cost of space flight. In fact, it may have raised it, uh, at least for human flight. There were alternatives. This was not the only course of action. And I would argue that the space shuttle was probably the worst space policy mistake the United States has ever made. Um, uh, one of the options would, given the incredible expense that the shuttle turned out to be, would have simply to have kept Apollo-Saturn technology. But of course, going back to the moon was no longer in favor. And uh, that could not be sold to the public or to Congress anymore. And so uh, having a new innovation or claiming a new innovation of space travel was the only thing that was saleable in the early 1970s in a period of dramatically falling massive budgets. And it's, um, you need to keep in mind that between 1966 and the mid-70s, NASA's budget was effectively halved. So the options were that. Uh, 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 Bob Truax is advocating the big dumb booster, namely 
uh, use good old expendable technology and make it as simple as possible. And of course the Europeans came along and decided, well, there's a niche here. Uh, we can build a launch vehicle that launches geostationary satellites for communications. And while well, the shuttle turned out to be incredibly expensive, Ariane went out and captured at least 50 percent of the geostationary satellite market in the 1980s. The shuttle then, of course, became uh, the dominant launch vehicle for the United States, or at least it was supposed to be. Uh, famously, of course, this, the, the Challenger accident ended the attempt to uh, dominate the commercial launch market with the shuttle. But I, there's also a national policy failure, uh, which Roger and others have pointed out repeatedly. Namely, we couldn't figure out how to replace the shuttle, and we were still transfixed by the idea of the space plane as the answer, as the way to go. And so there were at least two major attempts to replace the space shuttle with another space plane that was even more challenging, even more technologically challenging than the shuttle. Uh, the National Aerospace Plane, or X-30, uh, which was supposed to use hypersonic technology, uh, a scramjet, way far too ahead of its time, and after much fanfare, disappeared quietly in the early 1990s. And then the X-33, another attempt to essentially create a single stage to orbit vehicle, which would put us into space with a reusable vehicle with no throwaway stages, and so forth. Um, the shuttle, instead of being replaced after a decade or, t or a decade and a half, uh, uh, continued in, uh, for 30 more years. Expendable launches, uh, expendable launch vehicles launch most payloads, and, and that became the reality. This diagram, which I believe is stolen from Air, uh, Aviation Week in Space Technology, shows the linear development of American rocketry and I think if you, the shuttle is in the dead center of this, but the reality is, of course, that post-shuttle, what we have on the upper right is all that expendable launch technology and its continuing development, which, as Howard says, is fundamentally improvements on 1950s ICBM investment. And here's the equivalent diagram for the Soviet Union and Russia, which even more so where you had a shuttle that was only launched once unmanned the, the expendable rocket has and remains, except for the, the purposes shuttle was used, including launching the ISS, the, the dominant technology. Now, a very interesting recent development uh, just on the verge of, of, of space access is the possibility that humans can now go into suborbital and uh, for tourist purposes, and increasingly, interestingly enough, the experimental community is also very interested in suborbital tourism. So suborbital tourism gives us a new uh, possibility of going into space, at least humans, at least to the edge of space. Uh, if we're still the rather uh, daunting prospect of $200,000, which I don't have, otherwise I'd be signing up tomorrow uh, uh, to do this, uh, to go into suborbital tourism, I think is a really important development. But we are still a long ways from making orbital tourism a re reality. And the, uh, the key number here, as I mentioned here, is that just to take the people up in this uh, spaceship one or spaceship two uh, to 100 kilometers and kind of the unofficial uh, uh, goal of, of, the, of the program is only 5% of orbital energy. Uh, it, 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 20 times as much energy is needed to put something in orbit and the, all of the stresses and strains and everything else that that entails means that going into orbit and orbital tourism is going to remain the province of the rich for a considerable time to come. Uh, so my conclusion is, at the end of this, we have had 65 years, as I said, near space access. That's the end of, world, uh, end of World War II. 54 years of access to orbit. Launch vehicles have become real, reliable, it is possible to go into space. This is a great, great thing. The prices haven't come down significantly. It's still about $20,000 a kilogram or around $10,000 a pound to go to low Earth orbit. Although, in fact, when you think of the inflation rate of the dollar, maybe we have made progress since the dollar is worth only about one-fifth or one-sixth of what it was in the early 1970s. Um, but we haven't got a revolution. Chemical rocket propulsion may be nearing its limit. Uh, I'm hoping that SpaceX delivers on what it hopes to do, and we'll be hearing about that in a minute. 
uh, on lowering the cost of rocketry very considerably more, but we'll see whether it does. I think fundamentally we're waiting for the next innovation, the next revolution in technology. Maybe the, uh, the, 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 the scramjet and the air aerospace plane is not a dumb idea, but it certainly is still a fair ways away where we have a combination air breathing and rocket as a way to get into space. And then there's all my all-time favorite idea, which still remains kind of 200 years away, it appears, the space elevator, where you could simply put a platform in geostationary orbit and a wire going down to Earth and you could winch yourself up to, geo to, to, to orbit would be the ultimate answer to escaping the difficult uh, task of getting out of the gravity well of the Earth. Thank you very much.